my uncivilized vitality. And I want to talk today about, uh, again, uh, I think I've talked about this before, about rumination and uh, the, the danger of overthinking and how that ties into UV. So the Uncivilized Vitality program of health and happiness optimization is broken into three parts, really. You have the, uh, the five vital paths, which are in uh, volume one of the book available on Amazon. And the five vital paths are about your, your health. So the movement, nourishment, restoration, hygiene, and community, those aspects for uh, mental health and emotional health. Those things you can make small changes based on uh, pre-civilized hunter-gatherers and uh, other um, original groups of human societies, how you can improve your life in that way. And then we have the field craft, uh, which is volume two, be out at the end of the summer, hopefully. Uh, field craft is when we go out into the woods and we get out into nature and we put some of these things to use in order to regain the three uh, lost abilities, which are capability, adaptability, and durability. Um, and then we have the, the 13 uh, tenets or philosophical uh, proverbs. That's going to be volume three. That'll probably be next year. But um, most of the time, uh, people associate us with uh, the field craft. So getting out in the woods and they think there's sort of a camping, hiking group. And that is a lot of it. And then a lot of people, especially uh, my patients, to get the health, health and wellness advice about different movement, nourishment, restoration, that sort of thing. They think of it mainly as... Um, uh, health and wellness uh, program. So putting the two together sometimes can be a little a little odd for people. We do monthly meetings with our local chapters. You can become a member uh, of a chapter or form your own chapter to uh, get a, a group, a community of like-minded people together to support the uh, journey along that path and learning those things. But one of the, the reasons we do uh, the field craft, right? The field craft is about being uh, about craft and caution in the outdoors. So we get them out, uh, we get people outside, and we teach you how to be safe uh, and ecologically responsible when you're outside. So you're getting the benefits of being out in nature while being safe, obviously, rule number one, and being uh, responsible with the environment. So one of the other, one of the major benefits is the end of overthinking. One of the problems we have in civilization is that we don't have, uh, this is gonna sound funny, we don't have enough to do. We um, are constantly busy, but being busy all day, and I know lots of people that are really, really, really busy, but busy is not the same as being productive. And people can get uh, overly busy <clears throat> because you know, you're finding things to fill your day. Um, and in our, in our original state in nature, the, what you had to do was find something to eat, uh, not to get eaten and find a safe place to sleep at night. I mean, it was pretty straightforward. Other than that, you, you relaxed with your community and your family and your group. You, um, you spent more time in, in leisure than you did in, uh, trying to stay alive. I know sometimes we're painted this picture that, uh, like Thomas Hobbes said that life before Civilization was nasty, poor, uh, brutish, and short. And if you've read my book, you know, I think that was, uh, I don't say flat wrong, but definitely skewed. And uh, we'll go into the reasons in the book uh, to streamline the video. We're going to skip over that. So one of the reasons we go out into the woods is for the end of overthinking. Getting out into nature, forest bathing, and, and forest walking, and just being outside has been shown in, in study after study, and maybe I can put some links in the description. I don't know if I'll go that far. You can look those things up. To have health restorative benefits, just getting outside and relaxing. Uh, all the way from sensory input, the wind, the sound of the wind, the, the ambient temperature changes, the, the humidity, uh, even the insects and the sounds of the animals and such around you can have a calming and soothing effect and help you slow down those constant, uh, the constant overthinking. So uh, I had a couple people ask me, and I said I would explain what I meant by overthinking and why people are, especially today, for whatever reason, this, the, the, the newer generations, the Gen Z and now the, the Gen Alphas will definitely be uh, doomed this way. Uh, anxiety. Anxiety is a huge problem nowadays. Uh, getting out into the woods safely and responsibly with field craft can help you address the problem of anxiety in a couple of different ways. Um, and the first way is you have to understand the difference between thoughts and thinking. Right? 
I have a, uh, a background in uh, Zen training. I spent about, came a little short of becoming uh, an actually a full or uh, fully ordained uh, Buddhist monk at one point in my life. And that Zen training, the biggest takeaway from that, uh, for me, dealing with um, things like intrusive thoughts and uh, negativity bias and all the other cognitive biases was learning the difference between thinking and thoughts. Thoughts are going to occur as a part of your biology, your anatomy, the way your brain works, the constant sensory input uh, from all of your, from your body, um, everything you see, smell, taste, feel, touch, even the things you, uh, the thoughts that come up, those are all just sensations. Those are, uh, your, your brain's firing and it's uh, producing thoughts uh, with the other sensations and processing them. Thinking is the act of interacting with those thoughts. So thoughts are going to occur. Thoughts are going to uh, bubble up. Thoughts are always uh, chattering in the background, like the, the Zen, the, the Buddhists say, the monkey mind. Um, you're thinking, you're moving from one thought to another and getting caught overthinking. You're moving from this thought, which will cause, right, action causes reaction, other thoughts. And then you engage with those thoughts, and then those thoughts lead to other thoughts. And then you have emotions that come up as a result of the thoughts or uh, events that are going on. Then you interact and react to those emotions leading to more thoughts. And it's just like a big cascade. One of the things you uh, can do, and I know I'm going to make this sound like it's, uh, it's overly simplistic, but it's uh, simple but not easy. It, it, it's very simple to conceive of. It's very difficult to put into practice is stop engaging with the thoughts as they arise and you have a thought come up and there's you don't have to engage with it you can say hmm, that's that's interesting that's peculiar and it's not like you can uh, stop the thoughts a lot of times people think they can meditate or go to uh, uh, zen training or pray hard enough and they can stop the thoughts uh, you cannot the thoughts are going to come constantly as long as you're alive your brain is on the thoughts are going to uh, continue coming you can't even stop the thoughts. Now, who's ever watching this video? You've probably seen this trick before. Uh, I can make a small proof to you that you can't control those thoughts or stop them. If I ask you to clear your mind and then do think of anything else except uh, an elephant. So do not picture an elephant, uh, nothing about an elephant, not the trunk, the big floppy ears, the gray color, the big stubby feet, the noise, do nothing at all that allows any thoughts related to elephant to come into your mind. And then of course, nobody was able to do that because that's not how your brain works. I can do the same thing with an apple or an airplane or a gorilla. Anything I mention, your brain will automatically produce thought related to it. <clears throat> so, and it's not just, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, words or conversation that cause thoughts to bubble up. It's gonna be sensations or uh, emotions or uh, physical sensations. I mean, like I'm hot, I'm cold, that'll cause thoughts. I, I ha I'm angry or disgusted or sad or surprised. Th those will uh, initiate thoughts. Memories and other thoughts will initiate thoughts. So it's a constant bubbling process. The, the key, the secret to all that is you don't have to engage with those thoughts. When you engage with those thoughts, then you're, you're thinking. Uh, obviously, some thinking is good. I have a thought and that spurs uh, some action on my part that's healthy and beneficial. Great. Or if I can take the thoughts and analyze them uh, with uh, detachment. Um, who said that? I think it's attributed to Aristotle where he said the, uh, the mark of an educated mind is the ability to uh, engage with a thought without accepting it. Right? So that's one of the, I think that's right. Somebody can check it. So um, thinking is fine. I'm not saying that's bad, but overthinking is when you bounce from thought to thought and you're constantly engaged and you begin this whole cascade or sometimes referred to as a spiral. And it's usually a downward spiral. If you combine the tendency to overthink with uh, very specific uh, biases we have in our thought patterns, like a negativity bias or a selection bias or confirmation biases, those or common cognitive distortions like discounting the positive or catastrophizing um, or personalization. When you take normal cognitive dissonance um, that's caused by these biases and these distortions and combine that with the, the overthinking, bouncing from thought to thought, you can drive yourself nuts, right? Uh, I spent 
a long time doing the, the traditional Zen training where you sit and at first you're going to wrestle with these thoughts and try to control them. And eventually you're going to realize like, oh, you can't control them. You just have to let them go. And one of the, the quickest ways to get over, let's say you have an intrusive thought that's every time you think it, it keeps coming in and makes you upset for whatever reason. Um, but it just keeps popping in there and you try to distract yourself. Uh, a lot of people get into, um, they use drugs or nicotine or caffeine or alcohol, especially to escape those thoughts. Well, that's not going to work because you can't escape uh, the, the thoughts. Thoughts are thoughts. They're always going to be in there. So uh, people try to, to wrestle that down. They'll lock it down, uh, lock those thoughts down, avoid them. One of the quickest ways to get over those sort of thoughts is to let them come in, observe, and then let them go. All right. Uh, again, easier said than done. And obviously, uh, as a, I guess as a caveat to this video, if you're having intrusive thoughts or thoughts that are that are troubling or leading you to either self-harm or harm to others, obviously you're going to need to seek professional help or talk to somebody and uh, decide if that's the, the run of the mill uh, overthink that's causing anxiety or if that's something more serious. So I probably should give that caveat at the beginning, but generally overthinking is caused by over engagement with the thoughts that bubble up instead of letting them come up, observing and letting them go. This is something we can teach kids right away instead of saying things like, oh, are you, uh, are you angry? Are you upset? Right? Cause they got into argument with their sibling or something. Um, the wife and I raised, uh, four, our four boys and yet four little animals in a house with Legos and, uh, the tendency the boys have when they're younger, um, <clears throat> you're going to get some, you know, some upset feelings and conflict. So we tried to make, obviously we slipped. We tried to make a practice of, instead of saying, are you angry or, uh, are you upset? We'd say, are you feeling angry? Uh, are you feeling upset? So they would learn to identify these thoughts and emotions, right? And sensations as separate from uh, the self, right? So you are having anger. You are not anger itself. You are not angry. You're just having anger. And uh, sometimes people can learn to do that with their emotions. They can even learn to do that with their sensations. That's actually pretty easy, right? Like, um, I'm having pain in my thumb or, uh, I'm having pain in my neck. I have chronic pain in my neck and my hips and my arms and all my, um, broken areas as, as uh, time marches on, but I don't identify with those, those sensations. I'm just experiencing them. I don't, I don't identify with my emotions. I'm just experiencing them. I don't identify with my thoughts. I'm just experiencing them. And this is a little more difficult for people sometimes. Uh, to, to disengage with or just observe without becoming entangled and then uh, overthinking. All the way back to UV, the field craft. I, I believe, this is my idea, that one of the reasons we tend to overthink and overengage is the constant little dopamine hits from um, being engaged all the time. Social media, the internet. Uh, this is why in the book I recommend you take at least an hour a day to yourself without the phone, without the internet, without any distractions and you just sit. You can break that up, obviously. Uh, we talk about the golden hour in other videos. Get outside for an hour, sit down for an hour, be by yourself for an hour. <clears throat> this will help you start to experience the sensations, emotions, and uh, thoughts right, that, that come up and just observe them without engaging. This is very difficult. One of the main reasons that I've folded field craft into the program and getting outside, even if it's not necessarily camping or hiking, just a day out in the park, is because when you're out engaged in nature, there's a, there's a certain amount of sensations that come in. They're going to cause certain types of emotions and it's going to distract you in, in a, in a way that's not necessarily a distraction. Like every time I have this intrusive thought, I just. Uh, I go do like 10 push-ups, or I eat a donut or whatever. Maybe that's self-destructive, but when, I, when I'm outside in the woods at camp, for instance, and everybody that's been camping with us eventually remarks on this, uh, you get a time distortion that happens. We'll go up, we'll be gone from a Friday evening to a Sunday morning. And people constantly remark, I feel like I've been up here for a week, right? I feel so relaxed. And, you know, time seems to slow down. You get a time distortion because your, uh, your brain slows down on the thought production, right? Because you're so busy engaged with your sensations and just the, the, the joy and freedom of being outside and relaxing 
that you don't have enough energy to engage, over-engage with these thoughts. So being outside, not at first, <laughs> a lot of times at first, the first time you're sleeping outside in the northern Michigan woods and you hear something large uh, walk by your tent maybe, uh, or make a growl or a yip or a squeal sometime in the night, that can be a little anxiety producing in people at first. That's why we teach the craft uh, and the caution. So after a while when you feel safe, eventually you'll, you'll sleep and you'll start to uh, look forward to the next event getting outside because it helps you stop overthinking. We are constantly engaged, mindful with the moment when we're camping. We have to get firewood. We have to erect our shelters for later that night. We got to get dinner. Then we have to clean up after we eat our meal. Then we have to get water. Then we have to make sure that the camp area is policed up and we have fire safety. And the whole time we're engaged with each other, telling stories or laughing. Um, sometimes we have entertainment. Somebody will tell a funny story or uh, we've had music at the camps. Um, we work together, we cooperate and, and it, you're constantly engaged. And the next thing you know, uh, you've spent a 14 hour day moving around and, and engaged mindfully in these things. And you realize that you weren't able to, able to overthink. You just didn't have the time or the space to overthink. Uh, yet the thoughts were still coming. You'll notice you had thoughts during the day like, oh, I got to remember to do that when I get back home or, um, or, oh, I couldn't get that, uh, I couldn't get that tree to fall the way I wanted. I have to learn how to use the ax. So thoughts will come up and then you will uh, disengage with those thoughts and just move on to the next thing. You end up staying in the moment and being mindful without even trying. This is an overused term. <clears throat> Mindfulness, uh, as far as my, my Zen training would define it as observing these three thoughts, emotions, and sensations without engaging. So if you can observe these three without engaging, you're, you're in, uh, you're in a mindful state. Uh, sometimes called, uh, the flow being in the moment, um, mushin, uh, I think it's the Japanese word, just being in the moment, right? Almost like a, a daydreaming state while you engage with the different things you're doing or feeling or the thoughts you're having, right? And not engaging with them, not thinking, uh, not engaging with your feet, uh, your emotions. So you're not over feeling. So feeling would be engaging with that. And then the, uh, the physicality of, uh, of being obsessed with, you know, small aches or pains or different physical sensations. I got to come up with the term for that. I can't think of it right now. So not over engaging with these things will allow you to be mindful getting out into the woods on one of these campaigns or just sitting in the park for an hour or going for a walk down a wooded path uh, or even in your yard and just strolling around will help you engage in mindfulness, just being outside. And, um, that is why we do it. So that is why we get up in the field craft. One of the reasons we do is it's the best way that I have found <clears throat> to engage in mindfulness directly. You can go the, the yoga method, um, the Zen method where you just sit, uh, it takes a little more uh, time and discipline and understanding. You can go the self-destructive habits, right? Obviously some people choose that and we can't recommend that. Uh, but there are different ways to uh, get to this mindfulness and be able to uh, disengage from overthinking, interacting with your thoughts, emotions, sensations. And the easiest way is just to get out into nature. That's where we're supposed to be. It helps us uh, reconnect with the primal um, part of ourselves that just lets that, that happen uh, naturally. So there's my long winded rambling explanation of mindfulness and why we do field craft and how to how to understand or start to understand the difference between thoughts and thinking. Thinking is engaging with your thoughts. Feeling is engaging the way we use it colloquially is engaging with your emotions and you can do too much of both of those. And then, uh, over engaging with your sensation is, is that happens a lot in, in, uh, in my profession, working with patients that over engage with their pain syndromes. And, um, sometimes I can help them with that, but that's beyond the scope of this video. So, uh, there's a little bit of that. If you found any value in that at all, or even if you managed to stay to the end of this, uh, rambling explanation, uh, give us a thumbs up and, uh, hit the like button, the notification buttons, um, leave some comments below. And, uh, I think that's about it.